Hello and welcome to the video version of Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient times to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with Dr. Karsten Selk Jensen and Dr. Stephen Bennett, co-authors of Christianity and War in Medieval East Central Europe and Scandinavia, published February 28th, 2021 by Arc Humanities Press. Thank you both for speaking with me. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. So first, um, I'll start with uh, Karsten. How did you get into studying this subject and co-authoring a book on it? Well, uh, it's, it's, yeah, actually it's quite a long story. I mean, I've been working with the, the Baltic Crusades for, yeah, I, I think nearly 25 years. So it's kind of been my, uh, at least part of my uh, field of research and, and field of interest, this uh, idea of crusading and religion and warfare. And then a few years back, I was uh, invited to participate in a, in a, a, a book on uh, uh, on uh, warfare and medieval clergy, and that was edited among others by uh, Aruslav Kuczeki, who is who is uh, the co-author on, on this particular volume. So he invited Stephen uh, and, and me to to join him in this new project, uh, a bit wider uh, geographical scope, uh, but some of the same themes. Mm -hmm. And Stephen. I, I came to medieval studies quite late. Uh, I spent most of my adult life making best use of hardcover in Her Majesty's name in the armed forces yeah. uh, and uh, left after about 16 years and then started a, a slow progress into academia part time. I had a young family and, you know, all the usual financial things you have to sort out. So um, mine was quite a, a different journey to Carston. Um, uh, I know there's a, a lot of part time students in the US. So I just hang my hat and say, you know, hang in there. I know it's not an easy journey, um, but you will get there. And um, as you'll see, you, you, part-time scholars are are recognized by their full-time scholars as, as worthwhile companions and compatriots in this sort of project. So the reason I, I was invited in is my focus is a military historian and primarily in outside this region. Uh, I lived in Denmark for a fair few years, so um, listened to Carlson speak many times about the Baltic Crusade and, and, and other colleagues there. But I was very much brought in as somebody who didn't have any existing opinions about any of the elements that would be touched upon. So um, my, I think my role within the editing process was perhaps to bring a, an outside perspective in and look at the comparisons as somebody who doesn't know either side of the comparison very well. Um, so I'm the only one of the three of us that don't actually have an article within the book because it's it's not my speciality. But um, it was a I learned a great deal through through the the various uh, chapters involved, and that has in turn influenced um, some of how how I look at things in my own geographical area of northwestern Europe and and the, the Holy Land. And I'll just say, I, I have a particular interest in this subject because um, my mother was Lithuanian and I grew up, a, spent a lot of time with my Lithuanian grandparents who, who hung a painting or a, a, a picture of a, a West facing knight. You know, they were staunch Catholics, but I also know the history of how resistant the Baltics and Lithuanians were to Catholicism at first and the Templar Knights were the evil, the evil people um in the history so so yeah so this period is very fascinating for me just from a personal level um well, you'll enjoy this story chris because it's it's i'll get corrected by carsten who's the who's the specialist on this but i understand the lithuanians converted quite early and in fact um in one of the the early crusades i think carsten was around about the second crusade a bunch a bunch of crusading knights turned up in lithuania to 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 forcibly convert cities and 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 um take what what wasn't nailed down back home with them only to find that the the occupants were already christian and catholic christian at that uh, <laughs> most disappointed i understand they were is, is that i mean carson will fill in the gaps for me well, so, so, sometimes you're uh, kind of 
miss the point and go to the wrong people. Well, I, I think actually the Lithuanians were, well, some of them accepted Christianity, but they were, as a whole, they were actually the, the last uh, greater nation in, in, in Europe to accept Christianity as a whole. So it was a very, very long and fascinating process. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you have some very proud ancestors there who, who really stood up and fought for their country. Well, well, it always strikes me as odd how proud they are of their resistance to it and then how proud mm -hmm. they were of having become Catholic. So there's yeah. this weird very interesting tension um but 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 that's if i may add that that is also something very fascinating by by lithuania and estonia and latvia you have this i mean very fascinating medieval history but it also a a, a, a story that is very much alive in, in the current nations they have uh sort of uh, included this medieval stories in, in their own uh, current national narrative. So mm -hmm. as a medieval, at least we work with some very old stuff, but at the same time, it's very much alive in, in these uh, different countries. So that's, that's really fascinating. So let's talk about the book then. Um, so talk, tell me the time periods and the region specifically for listeners and, and viewers what, that we're talking about. Yeah, in the introduction, we would decide that we would say uh, the, the, the 10th century would be sort of the, the starting point because uh, the, all these uh, countries from Scandinavia and down to Poland, uh, Romania and some of the Balkan uh, countries, they, they were, in a sense, all newcomers to Christianity. And, and this process commenced sometimes in the 9th, 10th century and, and continued to uh, two, three hundred years, perhaps even 400 years. So that's sort of the, the, the time frame we are operating within. But we have this, uh, I mean, uh, as I said, I've been studying the Baltic Crusades for many, many years, but it has often been this perspective from Scandinavia to the Baltic or from Scandinavia to the Baltic and back to the central European countries, the, the old uh, European country. And in, in this book, we wanted to try something new to, to see Scandinavia, Baltic uh, and, and the yeah, central Europe in, in, a, in, a, in a new perspective. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, let me ask you, in the book blurb, it mentions um, sort of military clerics, you know. Um, can, do, do you want to address that that bit? Well, um, what I think this book highlights in so many areas, but particularly in sort of the warrior cleric, um, is it reminds me of what, of, of what, Norman, uh, what Morgan Freeman said in the Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, mm -hmm. that Allah loves glorious diversity. Mm -hmm. And what you get um, is there is no one size fits all solution. You have um, clerics who actively oppose holy war in a martial sense. They believe it's a very much a spiritual en endeavor mm -hmm. and that um, even if they accompany a military expedition, they will be accompanying it as somebody who is organizing religious activity, who are praying, who are taking part in ceremonies, but not actively participating in, in religious violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have those who are the, and, and there are a few characters within the, within the book that are highlighted, who are the very epitome of the, the, the warrior bishop mm -hmm. in, in mail, wearing a helm, carrying um, a sword and, and fighting alongside lay knights uh, and indistinguishable from a feudal lord. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that's because by the time you get to the level of a prelate, a bishop or an archbishop, you often hold lands from um, a king. So whilst you might be a religious leader, your lands will also have a, a military requirement to support um, your monarch. Mm -hmm. So some of them would then take that a step further because they come from, of course, the same class. Their, their brothers um, may well be lay magnets in neighboring lands and who are fighting in a traditional knightly form. Mm -hmm. And they just follow that, that, that same process. Um, 
and others, as we say, um, will send representatives in their stead because they they don't believe in participating in in military action. So you you do get a complete spread. There is no um, one size of what a what a bishop is supposed to do. And what's fascinating is is even within the religious orders like the Cistercians or in the book we talk about the Dominicans, there's a there is room for individuality of, of disagreeing with what the central um, uh, narrative is as long as you don't stray into heresy. Mm -hmm. So there's a very strong Pacific component within Christianity that survives. It's not all martial Christendom. I'm speaking with Dr. Karsten Selt Jensen and Dr. Stephen Bennett, co-editors of Christianity and War in Medieval East Central Europe and Scandinavia. You can find more information about their work on their academia.edu pages and on Twitter at Dr. Stephen Bennett. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please tap the like button and bullseye the subscribe button. If you want more interviews with military historians or to get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out fullcontactnerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out technologyandspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. So, and I'll let either of you answer this. Were, were these clerics, did they use um, church money to um, finance their, their military activities? Or was that more their personal finances? You know, there's a whole slew of, of sort of administrative, logistic, and, and, and legal issues I, that pop up when you talk about this. Yeah, well, it's kind of, uh, it's very interesting, but also a slightly difficult difficult question to answer because, I mean, there's a lot of um, incident where, for example, the, the Pope or the papal legates, they complain because the local kings or the local bishops, uh, they would collect money for perhaps a crusade, but then they would keep the money for themselves and say, okay, well, we also uh, go on this crusade. So instead of sending the money to Rome, we better use them for ourselves. So in a sense, they use church money, probably also money gathered from their estates, but, but it's sort of a huge, big uh, economic uh, system. And so, so there is all, uh, all, always this, um, uh, discussion of uh, what is going to to the Pope and to Rome and what what is better uh, kept uh, locally. We also have these cases where um, local magnates, uh, nobles, and knights uh, they, they they knew of course that if they promised to go on a crusade, uh, they couldn't be taxed by the king. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of cases of noblemen learning about. Uh, um, the king's uh, tax collectors uh, being in, 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 in the neighborhood. So they rushed to the church. Say, okay, I'll promise to go on a crusade. And then when the collector comes by, I say, well, sorry, I'm exempted for that because I'm promised to go on a crusade. And when the, the tax collectors then left, they would pay a small fee to the church and say, no, well, okay, I won't go anyway. So here is something for for a kind of penance. So, so it's very, uh, you have this mix of high religion and uh, economic uh, uh, thoughts very mixed up and intertwined. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's, it's difficult to separate what is the bishop's money and what's the church's money. Mm -hmm. The church has been very careful to reduce the potential for a clerical magnet to hold lands that didn't belong to the church. So whilst to enter religious order or to gain status, the family might donate lands to the church to smooth the way for a son or daughter to become professed religious, that land then belonged to the church. It may be stewarded 
um, by the the cleric, but it, it belonged to the church. Mm -hmm. But of course, if your diocese is threatened, then you're going to use your whatever funds, whatever resources that diocese gives to the church to pretend to protect the church in that area. And just the term church is difficult because obviously we're not just talking about a physical building or the whole of Christendom, which are the two extremes of the church. You have the Hungarian church, which is Christianity in Hungary. And when you've got Mongols turning up en masse on your doorstep, then naturally the bishops are going to use that finance to raise funds, to raise arms and uh, equip um, troops to defend their, their diocese from invasion. So that's the church's money, but of course, and they, they believe they're using it um, in Christ's name for the benefit of Christendom. Um, so that, as, as Carson says, there is that conflict between what the central church wants. When we say Rome, it may be in Rome or it may be in Avignon at that point, but, but we're, we're, what's going to um, the papacy, what's being retained at a local level by archbishops and bishops. And you have the same struggle down to parish, hundred level where the local cleric is looking to retain some of the church's money to look after the poor and the disadvantaged at a local level. So let me ask either of you can, can start the answer for this one. So first in the book description, I was sort of fascinated with the idea that the borders were um, defined sort of by Charlemagne's reign and that, you know, these areas were the outside and I'm curious, with that in mind, was there any sort of grand or unified strategy in any sense with the Christian kingdoms as far as attacking and converting these outer territories? Well, uh, I would say it's, uh, well, uh, you have a kind of grand strategy. You have, you have the, the biblical commitment to, to convert uh, all people. So that's... Uh, uh, what we see also in, in the, the early medieval period, Charlemagne, and, and they have this very strong uh, political urge to, to conquer new land, but at the same time, they talk very pious about this task. They do it because they want to convert people and, in a sense, uh, make sure that, that uh, the, the, the history of human will move toward uh, the, the second coming of Christ and the end of time. So you have this very tense mix of uh, uh, brutal uh, power fight at the same time, a uh, very sort of pious way of, of talking about these things. So you have certain, uh, what you say in English, you, you, uh, uh, in the middle of the 10th century, the, the borders between Christendom and, and, and non-Christian areas would be some place around the river Elbe and perhaps a little bit uh, more to, to the east and then 100 years on it will move further and further so it, it's a it's an ongoing process I would say. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because when uh, I know there are ongoing military debates at the moment about how much we can learn from the lockdown process and uh, distributed command or, or, or commanding mm -hmm. a, a long distance and that is the reality of, of being a pope. You, even if you are on an itinerary and you travel around, there's there's only so much control you can have over your subordinates. You can have an overall ideology. Ideology, you can um, promote certain values and expectations. But what you see, um, especially I think in um, the Baltic Crusades, is very much the church reinforcing local initiatives and doing their best to keep those local initiatives broadly on track, mm -hmm. but accepting that um, there's only so much you can do in terms of controlling an expansion that is as much um, based on economics as it is on um, gaining souls. Mm -hmm. And, um, you, you know, you see the same thing, and this book very much tries to draw, keep away from, Crusading, and there are a few of the of the chapters um, do do cover crusades, but overwhelming, we're trying to look at non-crusading warfare because it's, mm. uh, and we're both crusader scholars, so you know it, it, it's 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 where it's um, <laughs> it, it, it draws in um, articles it does. But um, so you have a crusade, which is very much a 
organized process which has very um, specific indulgences if you participate legal protections and rights um, but even then in in terms of the first crusade and the and the, the popular elements that followed it there's only so much the papacy archbishops and bishops to, can, can do to control the process they may well put a uh, the pope may well point appoint a high-ranking cleric to, to join an ex expedition and they will join the council of war and do their best to ensure that the pope's desires are are reflected at a distance mm -hmm. but there's only so much you can do to to control a group of magnets who may have a slightly different or complementary aims yeah, were there actually yeah actually the the, the first sort of proper Baltic Crusade was kind of a, a, a local uh, branch of a much grander uh, plan to, to go to the Holy Land. And then the, the local Saxon uh, and, and Scandinavian noblemen said, well, it's, it's a really good idea to fight against uh, pagan, pagans and the enemies of, of the church. But, but why go to the Holy Land? I mean, we have them like mm -hmm. 50 or 100 kilometers from here. So we are in on this plan, but it will have to be local. We want to have our own uh, uh, part of this uh, overall holy war. So, so that was kind of, uh, as Stephen said, you have always uh, the entire time this negotiation between uh, the Pope uh, and, and the central magnets and all the local uh, people who for generations have been fighting their neighbors uh, and then at some point it became also a fight uh, between Christianity and other local religious ideas and then at some point you began to talk about this as a proper crusade mm -hmm. uh, and not just a brawl in your backyard or something like that. So let me uh, mention a few things that I think of when I think of medieval war and tell me how this applies to the, what you've studied. And one is a lot of cross-border raiding between regions. Um, two, you know, if you have resistance, you know, massacring citizens, you know, for, for resisting. I'm wondering if you had any of that. And three, did they put their own people in charge of conquered areas or did they just find uh, supplicants? you know, within the local populace? Um, depending on, on the region, you can find, uh, I think, uh, different uh, approaches to this. Uh, if, if we have a quick look at, at uh, uh, the Baltic and, and the Scandinavian involvement, first of all, you have, uh, you have the Scandinavians, you have the Danes, you have the Swedes, even the Norwegians uh, trying to, uh, conquer parts of the Baltic, modern day Estonia and Latvia, uh, to a lesser extent also uh, Prussia, uh, but they were the, then pushed out by, by, by German crusaders. Uh, and then, of course, you also in Estonia and Latvia have the Germans. So there's a lot of uh, people who want to encroach on these uh, uh, new lands, and, and you see a lot of different types of alliances. I mean, quite early, some of the local Latvian people would side with the German crusaders because uh, they have for perhaps many generations been a small tribe among greater uh, tribes and they have taken a lot of beatings. And now with these powerful allies, they could sort of uh, take the, the fight back to, to their, their ancient enemies. So they become close allies to, to the Germans and some of the local princes or chiefs became secular lords. Uh, but you also have the, the, the opposite, the German and Scandinavian uh, noblemen and princes who, who became uh, uh, the, the overall lord of, of these new regions. And of course, then you have the, the military orders. You have two or three local military orders uh, were established in, in the Baltic uh, region. Um, later came the, the Teutonic Knight, uh, originating from the Holy Land and uh, slowly moving uh, to, 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 uh, to the Baltic region also. Mm -hmm. 
Is there's an interesting um, in chapter in the volume by Judith Gale that talks about the archbishops of Split mm-hmm. and how the character, uh, although the region had already been Christianized, as it came under Hungarian sway and the archbishops went from being local archbishops to being Hungarian nobles sent down to rule the province on behalf of the royal family, how the nature of that rule changed. Um, so not only are we talking about uh, lay magnets being used to rule conquered territory, we're also seeing them using the ecclesiastical route to influence who the, the placeholders are. And in this case, it goes back to that, that earlier question you had, Chris, about warrior bishops, mm-hmm. is the prior to the Hungarian shift within the Archbishop of Split, um, Judith speaks very much to the local archbishops being very much uh, focused on local events and, and being part of the local community and not being martial in a particular form. But once the, the Hungarian influence comes in, these are magnets in every sense of the world. They, they are part of the Hungarian royal court. Uh, they will journey with uh, the king when he's, when he's traveling in the area and they take on a, a very different role within society. Um, so yes, you, you do see the use of both lay and clerical magnets to, to, to control um, conquered territories, be they already Christian territories that are coming in, with a, in, in within a broader realm or if they are newly conquered territories. Did, uh, was there much of a technological difference between um, the weapons and, and resources that the Christian kingdoms and the non-Christian kingdoms had? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, been a lot of research going on, uh, the importance of the heavily armored knight and, and the uh, the foot sergeants with crossbows and uh, so uh, different types of siege engines and and how important they were for for the overall conquest and I, I think that's uh, I think that's uh, a true observation but but again we can also see that uh, some of these uh, local people they fairly quickly learn to deal with these new, uh, newcomers and, and uh, the European kind of tactic. Uh, I mean, uh, one or two times, if you confront an army of crusaders in an open field, you have learned that's not the best of tactic if you are very lightly armed. So perhaps it was better to lure them into a swamp or, or something like that. So you have a kind of arms race uh, based very much on, on the local geographic uh, situation, but but also, and that's very interesting, you could see some of the local people adopting uh, the tactic and the uh, arms of, of the Western Knights. Uh, they uh, conquer steel, uh, crossbows, and, and learn to use that and also catapults and stuff like that and there are some very funny stories about them trying these new machines and they don't really know how they function and suddenly they throw the stone not forward but backwards and kill some of uh, their own people so so you have this uh, uh, i mean they they these crusaders and the local people, they knew very well that it was also an arms race uh, and, and they could sort of, uh, they could attract new allies if they promised the local tribe, okay, if you side with us, we can give you some arms, uh, perhaps uh, crossbows and stuff like that. So, so that was a part of the overall game. Did the non-Christian kingdoms have forts that were sieged? Mm-hmm. Where were the big centers of power in the non-Christian kingdoms? Well, if you we, we take the sort of the center of of uh, uh, this uh, geographical area we are concentrating on with Lithuania and Poland, you have several uh, huge fortresses who uh, would last for for many centuries as as uh, very heavily fortified places who withstood uh, several sieges. Mm-hmm. But, but that's so, sort of some of the grand places, but, but you have, I mean, hundreds of stories about smaller fortresses and stuff like that, local uh, places who 
became part of this game of military chess and they would uh, eventually uh, submit to, to one or the other side and then perhaps uh, have thrived for generation as a pagan center and then they would go on for the next hundred years as a new Christian uh, administrative center with the church and, and, and priest and stuff like that. So, and that basically has to do with that you have the big uh, strongholds, the big castles at, at very important places, and they are important to you, whether you are a pagan king or a Christian conqueror. So you would settle at the same places. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to start where we did um, at the 10th century is the decisions as to because, of course, a lot of these places were not conquered. They, they chose to become to become Christian because they saw a number of advantages, both in uh, at a, a simplistic level, uh, a being part of a of a winning team. Uh, if you're if your neighbors with successful Christian kingdoms. Um, and you are engaged with a, a neighbor who is pagan, be, being supported by Christian allies who will improve your trade, give you access to improved arms and, and, and equipment um, can be a benefit. But also there's the spiritual aspect of believing that you are moving to a more powerful deity. Mm -hmm. So, and again, Carson is, is the specialist on this, but you see during the Baltic Crusades, this process of negotiation that some tribes ally for spiritual reasons or for because they are involved with a civil war or a, or, or a conflict with a neighboring tribe they may change sides several times during the whole process so you, you've equipped them and then they take those weapons and and use them in the manner you didn't expect them to, to do so there are uprisings there are there are aristocrats who decide to uh, change religion but the people may not agree mm -hmm. Um, so it's a it's a it's a very complex process as to how the Baltic region eventually became Christian, as we saw with with, with Lithuania being a prime example. There were bits very early on that that became Christian. There are bits that took the whole period before um, they went that way. And of course, Lithuania has existing trade routes eastwards. It's it was very much favouring its trade from the east rather than from the from the west. So you have that alternative technologies coming from another direction mm. um, we don't delve deeply into technology in this book we don't talk in in the different horse types for example with the the heavy horse of the of the western knights confronting light horse be it in lithuania um, um, or the lats or the esti or or indeed elsewhere in hungary um, facing the mongols but you you know you are seeing not necessarily a ten uh, the, the, the adversaries are not necessarily lacking in sophistication. Mm -hmm. The technology may be different, but it may not be unsophisticated. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking with Dr. Karsten Selt Jensen and Dr. Stephen Bennett, co editors of Christianity and War in Medieval East Central Europe and Scandinavia. You can find more information about their work on their academia.edu pages and on Twitter at Dr. Stephen Bennett. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please tap the like button and bullseye the subscribe button. If you want more interviews with military historians or to get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out fullcontactnerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out technologyandspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. So what was the role of... No, the local religious leaders among the non-Christian groups, were they killed, pushed aside, incorporated in some way? Again, I think that depends very much on uh, what, what, what uh, region we are talking about. If I may say a few words about Denmark, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, they became... Uh, 
uh, or of a place very close to to a, a very uh, uh, eager uh, German uh, emperor who wanted to conquer new lands and convert these uh, terrible Scandinavian pagans. So one strategy among the Danish uh, kings were to sort of voluntarily convert into Christianity before they were conquered. So that was sort of a tactic to stay independent. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, neighbors of, of the Danes, the Slavic Vendic people east of the river uh, uh, in, in the eastern part of, of Germany, east of the river Elbe, who continued to, uh, to have their uh, non-Christian religion uh, and, and, and try to uh, sort of defend themselves against attack from Scandinavia, from Denmark, and from, from uh, German crusaders or magnates in, in Saxony. So they chose uh, another strategy and actually ended up uh, becoming uh, forcefully converted and conquered and uh, became part of today's uh, Germany. So that's different strategies. And you see that all along the, the borders. Uh, the, strong uh, rulers would uh, say, okay, what, what, what is the best option for me now? Is that to ally myself with uh, some of the newcomers, fight back or perhaps convert into Christianity and when the priests go away, then we can always return to our old beliefs. So, so and, and that's really the interesting part of this, see how these different strategies evolved uh, around the borders. Mm -hmm. Most of our the book though focuses on uh, on these new Christian uh, communities and how uh, devotional practice and war interacted. So there's only a small part of the book looks at uh, wars against pagan. A lot of it looks at the internal practices in in new Christian kingdoms, mm -hmm. how much they drew from older sense of Christianity within other parts of Europe and how much they retained uh, from a local level, how much that influenced uh, their practices. And so we, we've got these, these two big strands of, of, of war and Christian religion, and how they interact with culture, sometimes of which we, it, we drops into war against uh, non-Christian countries, but we've also got pieces that talk about civil war uh, in a new Christian country where both sides are on when I say new Christians they've been Christians for sometimes 200 years but their practices are are still evolving uh, and an interesting piece is on the how the paintings develop in Danish churches mm. and how they develop much more martial undertones as the as the as the period progresses, I mean, Carsten's much more uh, familiar with these because some of them are only a few miles from where he lives on yeah. Foon. But, um, so, I know it's probably the, the 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 more popular aspect of the period is looking at the interaction with 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 pagan peoples, but a lot of the book is looking at how these new how these young Christian kingdoms are developing a martial culture in a new Christian environment. So, yeah, you anticipate a my next question in a Sorry. sense, which is that <laughs> what um, what were the major non Christian religions, and were, were any of them martial in a sense, martial religions, you know, warlike? I would say most of them. Uh, the Scandinavians definitely were. The, the Baltic people also. They have very similar ideas uh, on, on the religious part of uh, Scandinavia and, and the Baltic. And if you go further uh, uh, into to, uh, to Central Europe, you, you'll see similar situation, but I would say very warlike uh, people who are used to, uh, perhaps they were descended of, uh, they, 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 uh, they were themselves uh, 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 conquerors perhaps generations back and now they very actively had to defend themselves against uh, new attackers either from the west or from the east mm -hmm. uh, and then 
as they became Christian, they sort of had to, to, to have their national or local narratives fit into this new overall story about being a, a Christian nation and defender of the church and, and the, the, yeah, the, the last bulwark against uh, all the enemies of the church. So that's what, very much what this book is about, how they, these new narratives came into being and how important uh, the act of warfare and going to war became in this process of establishing a new Christian identity. Yeah, well, what's the, interesting is down down towards the Balkans, of course, the, the big adversary was the Mongols. Mm -hmm. And they were very open to a, a variety of different faiths within, within their system. So um, whilst there was the overarching old shaman, shamanistic beliefs, you had, um, for example, the Nestorian Christians, which was an, an Eastern uh, version of Christianity that, that that grew up in in uh, beyond the Byzantine, on the fringes of the Byzantine Empire, and stretched um, eastwards into into Iran, and became very popular, among, especially amongst the wives of of Mongol generals and the Mongol royal family. And um, so you have the Mongols turning up with their overarching Germanic beliefs, but they had a number of different faiths underneath their umbrella that, they, that were coexisting and uh, there so for their perspective there wasn't this war with with christianity the, the perspective from the hungarian side was, was obviously very different they mm -hmm. see it very much as a an invasion with a, a hostile religion but it wasn't it, the other religion wasn't there we don't have a a hunt owning clash of civilizations going on at least not as far as the mongols are concerned Mm -hmm. Actually, some of the first rumors about the the, the Mongol uh, Mongols conquest that they, they, they were sort of uh, uh, associated with an old legend that at some point uh, there were there would come a, a, a mighty warrior from 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 the east who would uh, help defend Christendom against all uh, external enemies, and and when they first heard of heard about these Mongols, some of the theologians thought, okay, that might, might be this mighty warrior, Prester John, or the priest uh, John, uh, but uh, sadly it didn't turn out that way, and, and they became a very powerful enemy in the state. Yeah, so, some of, um, actually to step back to what some of what you were saying before, um, it makes me think of the Icelandic sagas, you know, and the tension mm -hmm. between you know, going from pagan to Christian, you know, that, that those tensions. So actually, were there any other, did any of these other non-Christian cultures have any literary traditions or any sort of anything like that, like the Icelandic sagas? As far as I know, there's not something comparable with, with the Icelandic uh, sagas, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, you have, uh, we, we have to be, be careful, and, and, and uh, Stephen just mentioned, we, you have the, the, the Orthodox uh, churches of uh, uh, Byzantium, but also the Russian uh, Orthodox uh, empires, and they are sort of, so you have a kind of sandwich uh, in this region, you, you have the Western Christendom, and then you have these non-Christian regions who become Christians, but they are at the same time squeezed from the east either by uh, other Christian tradition like the Orthodox Church uh, or simply by new conquering people like uh, like the Mongols uh, so, so it's uh, it's a very it's a very what you say there's a lot of actors in this uh, uh, in this region uh, and they all fighting for the same region and for the people to convert uh, either to Western Christendom or to, to Eastern Christendom. And, and control of the narrative, the, 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 the mm. Latin mm. church has always been particularly good at control of the narrative. And the reason that the sagas survive, obviously they were originally in an oral tradition. Mm. And the versions that we have have been written down by Christian clerics. Uh, so we're not quite sure, and again, Carson's the excellent one is, and there, there are people who spend 
their whole lives specializing in this field. So I'm mean, walking very careful on eggshells now. We, the degree to which the cleric influenced the story mm. is a, a source of a great deal of research by specialists in that area. Mm -hmm. um, whether, whether they change the story based on their existing Christian beliefs or whether how much was left untouched. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's a whole different field of study. So I said, I'm walking on eggshells in that stage, but no, fair enough. naturally he, the, the person that records it and observes it may well have an influence of some type on it. And the, and the, the thing that is, um, I think, extraordinary for a, a modern reader is the extent to which a Latin chronicler um, weaves biblical tales into their chronicle. Mm -hmm. You know, and Carsten is obviously from a from the 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 religious de the, the department of theology at, at Copenhagen, so um, it's much closer to this than I. But you really have to have a clear reading of the, especially the Old Testament, when you're reading a medieval chronicle, because they will be drawing from stories from the Book of Maccabees, from all sorts of old um, Abrahamic tradition to describe what's going on in their modern day because of course the audience they're writing for will be equally educated and will be spotting these underlying stories that they don't have to explain they can literally drop a one-liner in mm -hmm. the same way a teenager now can drop a one-liner from a popular tv show or a meme or a computer game and the rest of their cohort immediately know what it's all about mm -hmm. and us aged folk i've got no idea of the story for the for the latin chronicler they can drop a one-liner in and immediately the learned reader will know what parable they're re they're referring to and it gives a whole new aspect to that story that sometimes we as a modern reader just don't necessarily get straight away. Mm -hmm. you, you simply have these amazing, yeah, almost like biblical narratives, but going on in, in uh, Estonia or Lithuania or, or other crusading places. They, they are sort of a continuation of the, the biblical narrative. And it's sort of way to say, okay, we are also part of Christendom. See, here's our history and how we behave like the disciples of Christ and we are doing God's work. And, and, and yeah, so it's a very direct way of uh, writing uh, yourself into this greater narrative of Christendom and, and the God's, God's plan for, for mankind. I was going to say, but the, the danger, of course, is that means that the oral tradition of the pre-Christian cultures mm. are not always survive we, you know, we, we're so fortunate that the sagas have, have have survived in some form or another but so much has been lost elsewhere because it perhaps didn't fit that narrative mm. or you didn't get somebody who was aware of those stories who survived long enough to, to tell the story to, to get it down on paper you know or that or the other aspect is, is if it has been put down in paper that record just hasn't survived the centuries and reached our hands mm. In Scandinavia, you have uh, quite a lot of rune stones that uh, might be familiar to, to some of our listeners. Uh, Pre-Christian narratives uh, on, uh, on, on rock faces, and that's, uh, of course, is part of an, a pre-Christian uh, uh, narrative. But then again, they continued also into the Christian period. So you have this, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to say, okay, now you have a true pagan tradition and then uh, from here it's, it's, uh, it's a Christian. You have this mixed, uh, mixed uh, narratives and mixed symbols and you can, I mean, have what you might consider pagan symbols uh, woven into new Christian churches and, and stuff like that. So uh, really, really fascinating. I mean, that's, that underpins what's happening elsewhere in Europe anyway, where you've got the, um, a lot of the martial practices that are, are appearing in, uh, are in use in, in Latin Christendom draw back to ancient Rome. Hmm. Some of the military titles, uh, and it's a shame that Radak couldn't join us because he, he talks about the primus Belus, the first lance of a legion who starts off 
in Caesar's day as the regimental sergeant major of a legion, the, first, you know, the, the highest ranking centurion the, is very much the martial backbone of the unit. It's, it's, it's the same as a, as a, as a modern sergeant major in a, an American army unit. And because they also have this, as they do in, in Western armies still, the, the most senior soldier has a, has a, a cultural weight. They have a, an, an influence on the moral fortitude of a military unit. You know, they, they underpin the ethos of a, of a military unit that gradually moves into a, a quasi and then religious aspect. So when you get to Radek's piece, he's talking about the Primus Polis being almost a priest rather than being um now i i <laughs> i've had i've heard one liners from from sergeant majors who have said you know up till now everybody's told you they're god you've just met him I, that now we know that has a two millennia history and goes back to the the roman empire but it is a, it's a fascinating piece to see this very martial figure converted gradually over time into a religious figure and then appearing in medieval chronicles um, where it's no longer the legions are no longer around that that is a totally different martial tradition and yet the the the, the chronicler is using the same vocabulary to describe individuals in their narrative mm -hmm. and um, we do see this with with latin chroniclers they do go back to classical latin to try and use the same terminology to describe what they're seeing uh or being told about going on in their in their in their new environment which can be quite confusing as a was, historian was it uh was it bullfinch or i forget what what thinker wrote about kings and priests serving se you know being separate individuals and then serving the same role it, do you know what i'm talking about it was a classic idea in, in the middle ages you have these you have the so you have the church and you have the 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 military power of, of the, the emperor or, or, or the king and, and all the clashes and discussions between church and, and the secular uh, realm in the Middle Ages was who, who is on top of this pyramid? Is, is the king, uh, is he sort of a servant or the, of the church or are they uh, side by side and only God is above them? So, so you have this uh, fight going on on pretty much any level uh, in every society in the Middle Ages. Uh, and of course, also something that had to be addressed in, in these newly converted region because they also had to find their place there. Could they have a bishop who was also a king or did they have to renounce on that and the old tradition with the sacred king and say, okay, now in, in modern times, in, in the 12th or 13th century, we have the church and then we have the, uh, the, the, the king or, or the nobleman. Um, so, so they would adhere to, to the tradition of, of the Roman church. And were of there? course, as, as, as Carson mentioned, kings were anointed, I don't know they still are, but in, in this period, it, 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 was a, it was a very significant um, aspect of the ceremony where they were crowned, where they were anointed by the archbishop, which raised them above the rest of the nobility uh, to be to have a spiritual uh, symbolic role. That said, um, in terms of nobility in, in, in Latin Christendom, something that seems to be common across the region is that the nobles saw that they held their lands by right of God. Mm -hmm. And the reason that raiding was such a endemic part was raiding in an adversary's territory undermined their religious credibility. If you can't defend the lands given to you by God, then you don't have God's support and you're not the rightful ruler of those lands. Mm -hmm. It's not just the economic attack on that region of removing goods that makes it harder for that adversary to, to wage war. If you, if you take away their horses, you can take away their crops and, and uh, you absolutely reduce their ability to to fight you're also undermining their credibility amongst their their supporters that they are the rightful ruler for that, that region were there any um medieval popes or high high ranking religious leaders who actually put on the armor and went on these fights and then you know 
and I would imagine if they did, that would have sort of a, a an effect on the people they conquer, like you know. But I, I can't I can't recall any example of pope popes who actually took part in any of the formal crusades as uh, crusades as as a, a fighting pope. But you have uh, several examples of uh, popes who, uh, at some level, took part in in uh, some. Uh, concrete fights uh, in Italy and, and, and other places. So, yeah. uh, um, so yes, and that, that goes back to this discussion we touched upon uh, earlier, that there's a, an ongoing discussion in the Middle Ages uh, of clerics and, and warfare. Are they only supposed to support the fighting men, uh, perhaps deliver uh, troops if they are bishops or archbishop, or can they actually be part of the proper fightings. I mean, I have a, a, my favorite examples from one of the Scandinavian chronicles, and chronicles um, Saxo Grammaticus writing a story about uh, uh, the Danes and their mighty deeds. Uh, he, he wrote his chronicle, uh, I think he completed it around 1208, and it was sort of uh, it should have been uh, to, to the Archbishop Absalon, but he, he died before it was finished. So it became sort of uh, uh, a story about how great this Archbishop was. And one of the things Saxo write is that at one time, uh, the Bishop, uh, he was uh, taking part uh, in a raid against some pagan enemies and uh, the ships has landed on the beach and uh, the archbishop would celebrate a mass. And then suddenly he saw these enemy ships approaching. And then according to Saxo, uh, uh, the archbishop Absalom immediately uh, left uh, the altar and, and the holy service and said, okay, now uh, it's as good as having a service, uh, 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 it would be to fight the pagans uh, with a sword in the hand. So, so you have this archbishop, very pious man, building a lot of churches and donating uh, a lot of gifts to the poor people. At the same time, he was a very skilled warrior and uh, commanded part of the, the royal fleet and, and would presumably fight himself at the forefront of, of the battle line. And in, in the book, we have a chapter on the, the on Polish bishops. Yeah, that, the same. That, talk, that talks about those that didn't only support the army with religious um, ceremonies, but dressed in mail, took up arms, and took an active part in 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 military actions. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a. I'll leave the the readers to enjoy that one. Yeah, yeah, it's cool stuff. So let me um turn to um, how the research was done for this book. I guess it's everyone wrote on their specialty, but was there additional research that was done uh, for this? And, and sort of where, where, where are the archives for this information? Well, it was, um, as, as we say in the introduction, it's very much, uh, uh, we, we try to open a new area of studies. I mean, as some of these things have been studies before and, and uh, the sources are well known, but we also included new areas and new types of sources. So it's very a mix, very much a mix of uh, uh, a well-known and well-researched uh, source material uh, combined with uh, uh, new uh, archival studies and new material, new regions. Mm -hmm. um, and when we had to include uh, Stephen, so we made sure with his military background that everyone would deliver their article on time. So he was very important for the completion of the book. Yes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this stuff would be new to the Anglophone audience. Mm. You know, it's, it's long standing traditions at a local level and being able to get those traditions to talk to each other not necessarily for the first time, but 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 certainly uh, encouraging those dialogues. So there's room for comparisons that perhaps haven't been done before and comparisons with, with Western research that's not done before. And also perhaps the first time that the, the Anglophone readership can learn 
get insights into e existing traditions that perhaps have only been available to uh, a local level or I think perhaps those that can read German will, will be familiar more with some of these stories mm -hmm. but um, there's so many languages involved here that you you know you have to have a spread of, of different audio, uh, different authors to, to really draw this all together. Uh, and as it happened, we, we, we chose English for this volume, but I know it would have been uh, as popular in French or, or German um, and opening up the content. So you never know, we might be able to persuade someone to, to translate it in due course. So what, uh, during the course of this research and putting this book together, what surprised each of you the most? It's it's quite a, quite embarrassing to admit this, but but I mean, as I told you, I've been into this research field for perhaps twenty five years, mm -hmm. and there were so many of these special local stories and sources I had never heard about. Uh, so that is, from my perspective, so fascinating when you uh, invite a new group of people to sit down and plan this project. You get so much yourself as a scholar and get access to a lot of material you perhaps have heard about but never had in your hands and then all these uh, new things that you've never heard about so that was really uh, really great for for me personally and i mean a lot of these sources have have survived uh for the last many decades behind the iron curtain yeah. I, know it's, I know it's now for perhaps the younger generation that seems like a, a lifetime ago but in, in academia it's only a few decades that we've had access in the west to these to these sources mm. and um whilst some versions may have been copied and, and made it into into western archives many of them are only known by by the titles so um i think that's a i mean the same boat as, as carsten although i don't specialize in, in this area having access to these chronicles I hadn't heard of before and being able to compare and cast, contrast them the ones I'm, I'm familiar with and um, being able to note the similarities but also the, the very strong local differences um, has made this a really enjoyable project. Um, and I know there are a lot of gaps in the record with something like this but is there a particular question for each of you that you would love to get an answer to sort of a personal personal thing in this research? Well, we, we briefly touched about the uh, how many of these people who don't have uh, have written rec records like uh, in the Christian tradition. There's so, so many people uh, in this period who did not write down their uh, stories. And if they did, uh, it was destroyed by these conquerors. I would really, really have loved to sort of have the the other perspective of some of these narratives. I mean, it's fascinating to, to read a Christian chronicle about the, the, the missionaries and the crusader doing this, doing that, and, and also writing about the, the non-Christian people, but it is always a Christian chronicle writing about his, technically his enemies. I would really have loved to have uh, more or less direct access to 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 these people themselves. Mm -hmm. For me, it's it's partially and it's a bit selfish now, but it's partially um, answered in Cindy Kangas's article, um, where she touches on Bishop Henry, who is a, I say English. I'm not sure if he's Anglo Danish or Anglo Norman, but he is a a cleric who originates from England, who is um, starts off in 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 Scandinavia and, and ends up in Finland where he's killed with an ax by a local mm -hmm. and he's now the patron saint of, of Finland and so he's done a great piece on him trying to get the strands of his story together to un, un weave together what, what happened but there's so much more about those early years of the Christianization of Finland that we've we've lost because it's not it's not in it's, it's almost, it's, 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 a, it's a legend, even in the Christian Chronicles, mm. where they're reporting about what happened before and is only vaguely remembered. It's, it's 
it's not a proper saga because the saga, the original saga is not there, but you can, you can see that you, there were sagas that have been lost perhaps. So um, I really, I really enjoyed her chapter, but there's, you can see that there are so many pieces that are missing. that would be lovely to, to know more about it. Mm -hmm. Was there a, any emotional, did either of you come across anything that had a strong emotional impact on you? I know this is research on old, very old things, but maybe something struck struck you either positively or negatively. I would say perhaps not specifically with this book, but as I said at the beginning, uh, the, all these things uh, when we write about uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Poland, uh, Bulgaria becoming Christian, uh, it is uh, it, it's. Uh, uh, narratives that are still very important to to people of these modern states. So, I mean, you have to be a little careful as a medievalist who is very focused on the Middle Ages and you try to, to find the truth about a story. I mean, at the same time, you can actually hurt people, uh, modern people who have a national narrative about how they became a, a, a sovereign nation. And now there's this wannabe historians who tells us it's uh, it's not through and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I experienced that several times that you tend to forget that what you are doing as a scholar has, uh, uh, it's a different story if you are an Estonian and Latvia living with this, uh, with this uh, narrative as part of your identity. So, so you have to tread carefully. Mm -hmm. Stephen, I think for me it's when you get those tiny snippets and they're very rare mm -hmm. where you feel like you're getting close to the real people of the time because mm -hmm. uh, quite often they you know they are behind layers of of narrative but every once in a while um, a story crops up or there's a there's something in a source where you you where you really feel these are are people who you can imagine around you mm -hmm. of a very different culture you know we always talk about the past being a foreign country but just for a split second you get a, a small sense that you can you can recognize the humanity of what's actually going on um did you have any difficulties getting the book finished or published i would say covid didn't um, <clears throat> didn't make it easier but luckily we had done quite a lot of the work before everybody went into hiding uh, and I mean in this when you edit a book with so many people there will always be a, a challenge but uh, I think it was it has been a pleasure working uh, on this project and uh, our co-editor or primary editor Radoslav Kocegi he has done a great job I mean he's a brilliant scholar and he has these many contacts to to people I didn't know beforehand. I mean, I have my contacts in Germany, UK, and Scandinavia, Estonia, Latvia. Uh, so, so it's been a great pleasure working together with so many people. Um, and I must say, they, I don't know if you take, perhaps all editors say this, but there wasn't a single author who we found difficult either to discuss things with or to contact during the editorial process because. As you say, there are very strict timelines to get things done with a publisher, mm -hmm. and it may have got quite close a few times, but we we didn't have we weren't we were never, no stage of we as editors embarrassed that we were unable to get a particular chapter signed off and ready at each stage. Um, so we were very lucky that way. I, I know of other editors who haven't enjoyed quite that same degree of support from their contributors. Mm -hmm. So what's uh, the next writing project? Um, that the two of you are doing separately or, or together? I don't think we have something together at the moment going on. Um, I have foolishly agreed to write a book about uh, the Danish national flag, Dannebro, who is also associated with these crusades uh, in Estonia. There is a, a, a very important national narrative about uh, Danish crusaders going to Estonia and being nearly defeated by 
pagan Estonians, and then suddenly there is this flag descending from from God uh, as a proof that they will uh, be victorious. And uh, I try to get back uh, uh, this legend and see what was the proper battle and the proper narrative about this uh, national story and this uh, national uh, flag. Uh, so that's my next project. Uh, and Stephen? Um, for me, I've got a monograph coming out next month which we might want to talk about later, <laughs> which is um, elite participation in the Third Crusade, focusing on participation from Northwestern Europe, the Angevin Empire or Angevin realms, occupation of France and the Low Countries. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's my, I don't know, it's written, but it comes out next month. And I'm just started working on the Monfrat family, which is an Italian dynasty uh, who were involved in crusading from shortly after the first crusade all the way beyond the fourth. So um, uh, in fact, Conrad of Montferrat turns up in the third crusade. So that's gonna be the next one to kick off. So it complements work I've done on the third crusade by looking at a, a family um, who have a, a long uh, num number of different uh, generations involved in the process and see how, how that evolves um, with, when they are crusaders and when they are nobility of the Latin East and the differences between the two. So that's right at the pre-reading start. I've got a big stack of volumes on my left that we filling my summer. Okay. Um, so I think you've already sort of answered this question in a way, but um, what would you like the book to do, this book to do for readers? And you've touched on expanding understanding, but, but tell me what else. I would love it to uh, inspire people to do additional research in the gaps that we've left. Mm. Yeah. Or take a story at another stage further. Yeah, I would definitely second that. And that's all pretty much what our aim with, with this, this particular volume that uh, it's it's not our intention really to offer any definitive answers, uh, but instead, uh, yeah, inspire people to do more research in, in this region or in similar fields. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's what we hope for. Okay. Um, so where can people find um, either of you online um, to get updates on your work or, or anything like that? Do you have social media websites? I have uh, my website at the University of Copenhagen, the mm -hmm. Faculty of Theology. And you can access my web page there. Okay. And I'll spell I'm your on. name. Uh, so I'll spell sorry, your name quickly for listeners. Uh, it's Karsten is C-A-R-S-T-E-N, Selk, S-E-L-C-H, Jensen, G, or J-E-N-S-E-N. And Stephen? I'm, I'm on Twitter, mm -hmm. Dr. Stephen with a P-H, Bennett, double N, double T. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the easiest way to um, get hold of me. And um because i do have a, a facebook account but i sort of keep that more um for for personal stuffs mm -hmm. and i'm on linkedin as well so people can get through to me on that as well if they wish to yeah yeah and just to confirm so twitter you said is just at stephen bennett your name so if you search for stephen with a ph and then bennett double n double t mm -hmm. if it's got doctor in front it's me <laughs> <laughs> okay okay all right i'll put it in the show notes you'll see the you'll see a little a little crusading motif next to it of cruci people with crosses on their helmets riding horses so that, you know you're in the right right ballpark okay okay i can send you a link if that's easier yeah i'll include that in the show notes for people to check out um all right that's uh it's that's all the questions i have do either of you have any parting thoughts or words just no, I'm good. Just say thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I've taken a lot of both of your time, so I appreciate it. It's a fascinating subject. Um, so yeah, thank you both. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank Cheerio. You. Bye. In the next episode, I speak with Holly McKay about ISIS battlefields. Bullseye the subscribe button to catch that episode. Thank you for watching this video version of Military History Inside Out. If you liked the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you're looking for military history and general history including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, 
my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Thank you for watching.